And then we happened to be on a coach trip with him, and so we spent the whole coach trip <laughs> trying to get him to save vegetables right, again. Right, so where were you? Where were you going and how did uh, you go? I was on a school trip. I used to be a teacher, so we and were And he, a... he was a teacher? Yeah, he was a teacher. What he, did he teach? He was the head of languages and he was... Head of a... languages? Yeah. <laughs> the head of languages just to go... <laughs> vegetables! <laughs> vegetables! <laughs> It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome at 877-711-5611. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. True currents and thriving seas, wind blowing through breathing trees, strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. This hour is brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. 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 We figured you liked the bit so much last week that we would just play it all over again, once again, at the top of the show. So... There we go, and I can't even find my little drop-in about the vegetables. I sure thought it was here, but of course, I do have this one instead. We want kale. Okay, we <laughs> want we kale. want kale. Everybody <laughs> wants kale, right? Especially at this time of the year. Welcome to the show, and that woman you're seeing on the screen, <laughs> if you're watching on the news tubes or uh, the face block, is uh the, the, the face what the <laughs> face block i need something for them I, I need to i need to diss uh uh zuckerberg as much as possible because actually he's actually really kind of an evil human being uh even though uh we use his platform for free and then peggy i watch peggy back up and go uh oh don't poke the bear don't poke the bear uh i really <laughs> uh but so you know we have to we have to have fun with him at some point uh, but uh, the woman who's sitting there comfortably, look at those French doors and like, <laughs> hiding the mess <laughs> and, and the Christmas tree next to you. You're early with that, Melinda. <laughs> you haven't put the lights on it yet. Not yet. Uh, but Melinda is uh, pretty much everything that I'm not. Um, an, a nationally known gardening expert, TV radio host, author, columnist, uh, more than. 372 years of horticultural experience has written more than 15,000 books. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's what eating kale does for you. <laughs> exactly. And, cool. And that's why folks say, want kale. Okay. Uh, I, and, and, and when we get to the first commercial break, I'm going to find the oh, vegetables, uh, which was <laughs> which I had in there last week, and it's just disappeared. That's what I love about uh, uh, technology. Things just disappear. They just disappear, and you, you don't know where they are, really. Um, at any rate, uh, Melinda does uh, Melinda's Garden Moment program. You might have seen that. She's done the great courses, How to Grow Anything. Uh, a DVD series, uh, you can go to melindamyers.com. That's M Y E R S. I always spell that because I'm sure nobody ever gets that right, do they, Melinda? No, they don't. There's always an extra E or an I or some other spelling. And I had one guy tell me I was spelling my name wrong. And I went, Well, it's too late now. That's what my dad told me. So I've had people tell me that too. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I had a new one the other day, which was Noask. With an oh. S in there, yeah, yeah. And it turns out that I I was the one who typed it. So uh, there you go. <laughs> and it'll oh. never be off the, the internet, <laughs> and it'll be with you forever. No, fortunately, it was just oh. in an email. So oh, good. Uh, I didn't have to worry about that. You, you were uh, channeling an alter ego, that's all. <laughs> uh, I guess. Um, so uh, we love having Melinda on the show because, obviously, she knows 
everything there is to know about gardening, certainly in the Midwest and in a lot of other places too. Um, and it's midsummer, I guess, and I'm uh, uh, here. I'm under my umbrella, which. <laughs> No, 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 seriously, you don't realize. I should take, wait, okay. He's got a see. huge skylight over him. Oh, there, there, okay. There it is, okay, there's the umbrella. Uh, yeah, that is the uh, the hall coat tree, okay. It is, it's the coat rack. I've got a coat rack here, okay, and I put the, I tape, I gaffed the uh, uh, umbrella to the top of it because I was getting hit with sun uh, from this position by the skylight, and that doesn't work really well for Zoom. Uh, so, so Melinda, if you hear a loud crash, it's it, it gives up. <laughs> you're you're taking over totally because Mike is under the umbrella somewhere. Because <laughs> I, I I hung up my coat and it, it tipped the whole thing over. Uh, not that I need a coat uh, today, uh, boy. You know, it's it's Hawaiian shirt time. This is uh, what we do. Uh, but uh, Melinda, we're so happy to have you here because uh, we're going to spend the next hour just chatting away about what's going on in our gardens. Uh, I will allow you to start. Let's just get right into it. What are you seeing right now that is fun? Uh, what are you seeing now that concerns you? So the good news about all this heat, um, if you're growing vegetables and got them in in a timely manner and have been able to keep up with watering, they are going gangbusters. Um, you know, my daughter lives in a small city lot and I always give her, you know, I start some basil from seed and of course you have to share plants because you don't just start one or two, you start a dozen, right? And she's right. like, well, I can't keep up with my basil and she's a cook and she's harvesting <laughs> and drying and, and I'm even seeing that I'm a little bit of a late planter, you know, telling everybody what to do and then I eventually get around to doing it. And this heat's been good. On the downside, the weeds are going crazy. And you got to keep up with the watering because things are so hot. And you and I had a little chat earlier in the week about containers. And, you know, yeah. you may water your pots once a day normally. And, you know, I always check them every day. But with the 95 degree and more heat and the heat index, they're drying out a little quicker. So it might be a twice a day kind of thing or move them into some shade. So the heat's been tough on gardeners and tough on our gardens as well, but it is promoting some growth. Some we want, some we don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'll be honest. I have not had an issue with weeds at all. And oh, it, okay, I, your secret. Uh, my secret is I cover every square inch with some kind of plant or another. Uh, and really, uh, okay, no, I do have one weed. I have one pernicious weed that I have spent the entire growing season and I've pulled out hundreds, literally hundreds of seedlings. That is the morning glories. Uh, uh, I, am, I am working to eliminate morning glories on the fence. And that makes it hard because they germinate on the neighbor's side as well. Um, but uh, you cannot imagine how, if you've never grown morning glories, all you need them to do is bloom one season and then you're stuck for the rest of your life pretty much, unless you're relentless like I am right now and I'm ripping those babies out, but every day there's hundreds more. I don't know how many darn seeds there are <laughs> in the soil, but I cannot stop them from germinating. So I have to go and, and, and it gives me a lot of stretching exercises, okay, to get in there and try to pull them out. Uh, have you dealt with that at all, Melinda? Oh, I have morning glories on a trellis, a couple of trellises by our shop there. I planted a clematis and a honeysuckle, a native honeysuckle, and I put in morning glory, you know, uh, Papa Otto's, you know, an old variety. I planted them to fill in quickly and every year they fill in and somewhere underneath them is my clematis and my honeysuckle. And, <laughs> and I'm like you, I'm trying to keep up, but I turn my back and there's 10 more that have germinated. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not doing quite as well. I have a, quite a few gardens. I miss my small city lot on days I'm weeding like crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, right. And that's the point. I've got a small lot. So, and this year I, I removed part of the wooden fence, which was rotting anyway, uh, from my neighbor's yard, uh, or a, not from them, but um, in between my yard and the neighbor's yard, which has allowed me to get in there and start ripping some of these babies out. Um, and it's a never ending job. You have to do that every year. And, and I'm sure there's people listening right now who say, but wait a second, aren't morning glories wonderful? What a, you know, you, you get out first thing in the morning and they're blooming and it's so beautiful. And yes, you're right. 
It's a matter of whether it's worth having them strangle all of your other plants. Exactly. And so some of those plants we put in morning glories are considered invasive in the Northeast. And because of this very reason, not only do they germinate in your garden, but have escaped into some nearby woodlands. And so depending on who you're talking to around the country, you say morning glories, like you said, I love them. They remind me of grandma or my mom, or, you know, you get up early with your coffee and they're beautiful. Or you have the people like you and I who are struggling to get them out of the garden mm -hmm. and then the people who are struggling to get them out of the woods. And, and Peggy's the, been really quiet right now. So does that mean you're not fighting weeds or you're afraid to join my club? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, no morning glories. I've got okay. my own share of weeds. I've got, um, the whole back of my yard is just okay, taken thank over. You. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, and, and I we'll have palm we'll leave it at that. We're at a break. We'll be right back. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Melinda Myers. Yo, we're the wheat and we're taking over. No more daisies, no more clover. We grow fast and everywhere. Precious pansies, beware. We're the wheat. We're cool. We're the wheat. You might almost think that I had planned that with the conversation we had before. Although I have to tell you uh, that We're the Weeds is the whitest rap I have ever heard in my entire life. Uh, gotta love the kids, though. They're, they're giving it a go. Uh, and uh, I like it. We're the Weeds. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Uh, I'm hoping the audio is a little better. We were tweaking during the break. Um, how, how do I sound to you guys? Are we doing all right here? Better. Better, yeah. Great. So yeah. not good. Peggy's basically <laughs> Peggy's way of saying, no, it's not good, actually. Um, uh, well, see, it's, it's the challenges of Zoom and Internet connections. That's the problem. Yeah, I guess. Uh, and our guest is Melinda Myers. Um, uh, who is the, the queen of all horticultural um, doings, I guess. And uh, you can go to melindamyers.com, M-Y-E-R-S.com. Uh, and we were talking weeds, and Peggy, uh, you just started to talk about what the things are you're dealing with in your yard, which is very different from the yard I have. Uh, you're much shadier. Mm -hmm. you're, close, you're close to the lake. I mean, really close to the lake, Lake Michigan, which means you get a lot of influence from their coolness, cool yeah. weather and winds and all kinds of stuff that I just don't get in my yard. Yeah, it's much cooler this morning, for example. Um, and we were talking about tomatoes too and how much further my garden is behind yours. But um, weed wise, I've got a lot of things just taking over like my palm sedge. It's not a weed, but it's getting to be a weed at this oh. point. We planted it at our rain garden at, at the state fair where I usually speak every year. And so we dug and divided and everybody who volunteered took a chunk home and I healed a chunk in and, and, and I didn't even give it very much TLC. I just kind of threw it and go, oh, you're out on your own. And yes, I put it along an area where it can be contained because exactly what <laughs> you said, it is taking over, but I have stone and concrete around it so it's a little better contained than it was in our garden oh so it's, I, oh, it's gonna come marching over gets, the stone and the concrete it will <laughs> and and jewelweed and um just wild goldenrod too it's everywhere i i've got i had one uh, uh by, by the way palm said yeah it's a thud okay it will it i i have uh cut mine in half in the last couple of years and i keep an eye on it and you know if it gets uh, out of bounds i just go back in with the spade and say sorry dude oh yeah yeah a lot of it has met the compost bin mm -hmm. right um but what was it you just mentioned also um uh, jewel, jewel weed and goldenrod goldenrod i had one little goldenrod mm -hmm. show up a volunteer in my yard and now i've got like 80 patches of goldenrod in my yard it, it, it's yes. And there are, um, there are some that are a little less aggressive. So when you're trying to plant for pollinators mm -hmm. and you're selecting goldenrod, those volunteers that show up in your yard are obviously the ones you don't want. Yeah. But, but um, you know, you bring up a good point that a lot of our native plants are wonderful, but they can also be very aggressive. Think about how they hold their own out in nature. And so selecting carefully when you have a small yard, or as Mike mentioned, digging and dividing, and you're doing the same, Peggy, um, you know, it's important to just kind of keep an eye on some of those. Doesn't mean you can't grow them. It means 
decide what you want to grow and how much effort you want to put in and then decide if that's one of mm-hmm. one of those thugs belongs in your garden or just go visit it somewhere else. Yeah. 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 And then, I was go gonna ahead. say, and then you have the lemon balm thug, but that's a different problem. <gasps> Oh man, <laughs> it took me years to get it out of my city lot. It is not, I did not bring it with me. <laughs> I, I know, and I, will, I won't grow it anymore. Um, it's a wonderful plant, and yes, it's a, an herb, and you can make teas out of it, and that will take over your yard, especially if you, shade, if you have a shady area, because it's got such an advantage over all the other plants there. It doesn't need, you know, you're not going to really get a bloom out of it, and uh, it's there to fill, <laughs> it's there, it's a filler. Um, but I thought I think you made a really good point there, Melinda, about natives, uh, which is I think a lot of folks think that because here's the problem. They go buy a native in the store and they've got all these other plants in the yard and the native gets sickly and dies because it wasn't in the right spot and it never gets a chance to do its thing. Uh, the problem is, if it does, they can take over, too. Uh, yes. It's just a matter. It, it just because it's a native doesn't mean mm-hmm. it's not going to be invasive in your yard. And if you look at natural prairies, um, Dr. Evelyn Howe, who is a landscape architect at the University of Wisconsin, had a great analogy. She says we take an ecosystem, the prairie, that grows on thousands of acres naturally, and put it on a quarter acre lot and expect it to act the same. And if you look at that, right, if you look at a prairie, here's a mass of coneflowers, here's a mass of rudbeckia, they'll all eventually intermingle, but each plant can duke it out because they're equally assertive. You put them on our small lots and then they just take over. I planted three coneflowers when I lived in the city, purple coneflower. I had nothing but purple coneflower in my little backyard three years (laughs) later, right? And so I, I love them but I wasn't keeping track of them. I wasn't weeding them out. I wasn't, you know, managing them properly. Mm -hmm. And after that one year of the great fall show, the next spring we started thinning and, and taking care of them. So we could have a few and a few other plants as well. Yes, I was gonna say, Scott Stewart commented that it's all about planting in communities to help manage ecological balance. Exactly. And it sounds like he's a fan of Roy Diblick, who wrote No, K-N-O-W, Maintenance. And um, he's absolutely right. It is the way. Look at those plants. If you're using natives or non-natives, are they equally assertive? If you put two next to each other and one's a bully, you're going to end up with one plant and you wasted your money. So good point, Scott. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Scott knows his stuff, definitely. Okay. Uh, what, but, but sometimes I'm kind of uh, confused and surprised by plants that some people think um, are invasive, like Monarda. I have never had a problem with Monarda. In fact, this year, it almost completely died out, and I don't know why. I think it got uh, overrun by some of the other plants, and I have a few that I see there, and now they're trying to do okay. I might not even get any blooms out of them this year, uh, but the fact that they're still alive is is comforting, but uh, it, it depends on the community, as uh, Scott yeah. Stewart says, and it depends on your yard. Okay. And, and, and can I just, tr- invasive means it's leaving the garden, going into someplace native, and ag- aggressive are the ones, just because sometimes people throw that word around and then get confused. So not you, just those other people. <laughs> All right. That's um, the buyers more about plants in your backyard when we come back, when she stops laughing. Now, I've got two 30 species. Red Monarda in the back of the yard. I used to have a whole clump back there that disappeared years ago. I've got two blooming this year all of a sudden. Those seeds, I, I laugh, have, yeah. Yeah, I haven't even seen them in forever. The goldenrods have choked them out. And all of a sudden, oh, hello, look what's there. It's amazing, isn't it? Nature just, you think you know something and it proves you wrong. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, it's like I want to move those couples so I can... That whole back area has got to be cleared out, and I'm afraid if I move them, I'm going to get roots of something I don't want. Exactly. Sometimes I'll tell people to pot stuff up for a short term Mm -hmm. and then kind of monitor, like especially quack grass is one of my terrible weeds I'm fighting. And the last thing I want to do is start it in a new bed if it's not already there. I've been seeing a lot on a couple of listservs of people saying, how do we get rid of bindweed? It's terrible. Speaking of morning glories. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 
Thank you. Okay. And <laughs> well, it's weeds. Um, <laughs> the theme the of music, the day. <laughs> the music is, is, is like a weed sometimes. Too. It's, it's a just, thug. <laughs> it is a thug. You just can't get a word in edgewise over the music. And all because all I can do is all I hear is that music blasting in my head. I can't even hear myself when I'm uh, trying to talk to you. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. Can we start over? Can we just like, go, <laughs> go back to the beginning of the show? Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Actually, uh, it's such a pleasure to have Melinda Myers here on the Zoom machine. Uh, we got to make fun of Zoom, too, since we make fun of Zuckerberg. <laughs> so we need to uh, come up with a, a really nasty uh, euphemism for Zoom as well. I don't I'm sure it. there are many of them out there already. Oh, I'm sure people are yelling about Zoom every single day. And the prior, part of the problem is I th think we've realized uh, we do our show Sunday mornings, 9 to 11 a.m. Central Time uh, out of the greater Chicago area. Um, and Peggy and I have become uh, aware that we think there's a lot of church services at this time on Zoom. Uh, and I think that's why we have some problems. We're just uh, at the wrong time. So what I'm going to tell people is stop going to church, okay? Please, just stop. Just stop. Uh, God will understand if you're in the garden or you're listening to my show. Or at least turn your video off so it's not using up all the uh, bandwidth. Well, that's a good one. Turn <laughs> off the video. So I'm we've got Facebook mad, and now we've got God <laughs> mad. Okay, Mike, I think it's a little dangerous hanging with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm going after YouTube next, okay? You know, those, those folks at Google, what I want to tell the folks that go at, at Google and YouTube is that their editing machine is uh, about the worst program I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe that a company is big with the oh billions boy. Google has. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> So, uh, now, now I'm I just a guest on this show. <laughs> no wonder he's got morning glories taking over his yard. Shall I play the Melinda Myers disclaimer at this point? <laughs> I have nothing. I've never met Mike Novak. In my exactly. <laughs> okay. Now that I've gotten that all out of the way. Um, okay. So, Melinda, how's your garden growing? <laughs> You know what? One of the exciting things that I, I've, I think we've all been experiencing are lots of newbies gardening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we can have one good thing from this whole pandemic is it's getting us back in touch with nature for many who are already gardening. It's giving us maybe a little more time or a little more focus or a little more motivation. But there's all these new people that are starting to try to grow their own food, enjoying some flowers and nature. And um, I think we need to en enlist the help of all your listeners to help those newbies along the way. You know, you garden and some years it's great and some years it isn't. And we always know there's next season. But if you're new, you may not realize mm -hmm. that, you know, you can do everything right and it doesn't always work or you can do everything wrong and you luck out and you have a pretty yeah. good year. So I guess enlisting the help of your listeners is one thing I'd like to do is, you know, don't give up. And Mike and I talked about being patient, too, when we were chatting earlier. You know, you put a plant in and you buy those little tiny shrubs and they grow faster than you think. Mm -hmm. You know, that little transplant didn't look so great when you bought it. But, you know, a month later in the garden, it's really flourishing. And some things take several years yeah. to really reach their maturity. Or the or just the opposite. You thought it was going to fill in an area nicely, and it's not, and it's the same. It's the patience. Exactly, and I have some plants that are borderline hardy that I know they're borderline, but I want to try them, and they die back to the ground, but it's worth it. You know, some years they don't, some years they do. I just cut them back, and I wait, and I wait some more, and I'm re my efforts are rewarded. Some years they don't make it, but then I know, okay, space to try something new. Yeah, and, and plants usually do not behave the way you think they're going to. Okay, <laughs> just and and that's you know we talk about uh, when we talk about lawns um, it, and we get into the areas where people have bare patches, they're always they're always thinking, oh, it's going to fill in. They have this uh, magical notion in their head that it's going to fill in. And, and what I say to people is look when you have a bare spot in your garden you go out and buy another plant usually because you need you know but your lawn don't assume it's going to fill in but the same thing happens with your garden as well 
don't assume that that plant is just going to fill in that area. You, you got you to gotta figure out what you need to have there. Even if you think it's going to spread, often it spreads into the other patch. It spreads the other way instead of where you want it to go. Oh, and so one of, go ahead. Oh, sorry. And one of the things I love to do is I love to um, use annuals or maybe even perennials to fill in those voids when I'm planting shrubs or starting a new garden so that I know I have some color throughout the season with those annuals. I know that next year I'll have to plant fewer, so I'm not wasting any plants, but I've got some immediate you know, something immediate to mm -hmm. look at that adds color and helps fill the space to compete with those weeds that always seem yeah. to find the room. And I laughed, I was thinking about those bare patches in the lawn. They'll fill in, but with the wrong plants, right? <laughs> with weeds instead right, of your right. grass. You got so, plantains everywhere. Yeah. And so planting is going to help out compete those, those weeds and getting the grass in. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point, Mike. Well, I, I think another of uh, you kind of touched on too, for especially for newbie gardeners, if they have an area with a lot of bulbs or spring ephemerals, right now there's probably nothing there and the weeds are going to come marching in. Good. And, and I love to mix my bulbs and my perennials. So when the leaves are dying back or those spring bloomers are fading, I don't have to look at the love, ugly weeds. I'm not going to have to, I'm not braiding those leaves and, you know, putting little raffia ties. That's just not me. And so if I have perennials <laughs> coming in, right, you, yeah, you guess that, right? <laughs> and if I have perennials coming in, they'll cover that up and reduce my maintenance because we mm -hmm. want to leave the leaves. You guys know this, but we want to leave the leaves until they yellow so that they put the energy back in for next year and I have to admit I planted some bulbs a little close to the front of the garden in desperation last year I was just popping them in before the ground froze and at this spring I'm like what was I thinking they're right in the front so as they're declining <laughs> there's they're getting moved next fall yeah, yeah. so yeah I, I've got a, a coneflower in my front yard uh and it was right next to the sidewalk okay right next to the sidewalk in front of my house and I looked at it and I went that flower's not going to last and sure enough, uh, the next in the next couple of days, somebody had lopped it off, and I'm just like, Aww. just too vulnerable. Well, I've got others there, but you know, it was a volunteer. It popped up there, and I said, I can move it at the end of the season, um, you know, because if I move it now, it'll just take the whole rest of the summer trying to regain its form. Um, so you you just never know. And I think if there are newbies listening, are you listening to us talk about all our failures and our challenges? <laughs> and we've all been gardening a long time. And I think that's the other thing. You learn so much from your failures. I have no problem sharing what I did wrong because I think I learned more from those things than when it worked out. Because it's like, did it work out because I did it right? Was I lucky? Mm -hmm. Did nature help me along the way? So, you know, don't give up either. When something dies, you know, especially if you're in a small space, it's a chance to try something new. That's how I always looked at it. And, uh, and speaking of uh, newbies and understanding plants, the other thing they need to know is if they get a plant that's in a small container and it's a perennial, um, that first year, it's probably not going to do much. So don't give up on it. And even into the second year, often it doesn't do much. Um, and there's that old phrase uh, that plants creep. Sleep. Leap Sleep, sleep, creep, creep, leap. Okay, and um, and uh, you sometimes you speaking of patience, it's a matter of years. It's not a matter of weeks or days or months. So you have to have the long goal in mind uh, with your garden. And the problem is that those goal the goalposts shift sometimes uh, because plants behave uh, uh, in ways you don't expect, but also your expectations change and what you want changes. So while you're waiting for that to happen, you might actually move the goalposts to yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other one I get lots of calls on are flowering shrubs. So you buy a lilac in bloom or, you know, I pericum in bloom. You buy a shrub that's in flower, you put it in the ground and next year it doesn't bloom. And then the next year it doesn't bloom. And it's doing the same thing those perennials are doing. It's putting down its roots, something important for the plant to do but you want those blooms. And so I often have people go, well, it's not flowering for me. It was in bloom when I bought it. Well, they, it's pot bound, it's forced into flowers. So we buy them and it works. I buy them in bloom. It <laughs> works, right? And you put them in the garden and sometimes it takes a couple years for it to really get established. 
And then it's going to be a longer lived shrub because it's putting the energy into the roots instead mm -hmm. of flowers. And don't add too much fertilizer. We tend to overdo things. You know, people know I'm the spokesperson from a Lorganite, so I, you know, want to disclose. But it's low nitrogen, slow release, and it has non-leaching phosphorus, and it releases some of the phosphorus and potassium in the soil, so it helps promote blooming, hardiness, and disease resistance. But, you know, sometimes we pump it full of fertilizer thinking, you know, it's going to grow, it's going to grow, it's going to flower. And we really get lots of leaves and stems and no bloom. So less is more, you know, wait a year after planting your shrubs and trees before you fertilize and you're going to have much better results. Yeah, I, in many cases, uh, as I have told audiences, I think fertilization is overrated. And especially if you have good soil, you have good biology in your soil, the plants can take care of themselves, especially tree shrubs and perennials. And a lot of those get their nutrients from the lawn. If you have a lawn or if you're fertilizing your garden that's around those trees and shrubs, they're getting plenty of nutrients, mulchings, proper watering. And as you mentioned, soil, you know, using organic mulches, amending your soil is a great way to help build that soil and, and, and improve things. Are you a fan of digging in? We only have like 30 seconds here, but are you a fan of digging in uh, 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 compost and that sort of thing or just laying it on top? I lay it on top every other year in my perennial garden, but I will take an auger bit if I have a troublesome area and then drill some holes to aerate the soil and push that compost down. I I was a till I would always dig in compost. I do occasionally now, but it always brings up the weed seeds. So I'm yeah. you know, old practices are hard to change. They are. <laughs> like, like double digging. Well yes. into that. All right, that's Melinda Myers. We have one more segment with her. It's the Mike Novak show with Peggy Malecki, and we will be right back. Yes, I'm experiencing, um, speaking of compost and what's coming up, I've got little tomatoes popping up all over the place right now. <laughs> well, that's what our, our next guest says. He says he believes in uh, uh, that's how you, you do per permaculture, wait for the tomato seedlings to come yeah. up. But I haven't seen any in my yard. Uh, so, But then again, I've been growing some hybrids, and you're not going to. Well, you might see them, but they won't be <laughs> the, like the may not be getting what you want, right? Yeah. Well, I've yeah, I've no idea what these are seeds from. They're well, and that's just, the other. Sometimes yeah. it's a nice surprise. Sometimes yeah. you're disappointed after you put the effort in. So, and the biggest of any of them is growing right in the middle of gravel in my rain garden. <laughs> Go figure. There's no compost there. <laughs> it, it's amazing. It it uh, every year there's always those things that are just like, really, that's going to, that's growing there. Yep. And I've nursed hey. this one and it's dead and it's, I know. Yeah, that one's going. So Scott brings up a good point. He says, loving this discussion of so many new gardeners, newbie gardeners can learn a lot from visiting public gardens, talking with their professional horticulturists and exact and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's going. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's me. I was, uh, oh. I, I, I wanted to get to Facebook, but I knew if I clicked on it before, the audio would come through. But yeah. I don't know if it but happens. But I think we're off right. Facebook audio right now, but that might be a point we want to bring up about visiting public gardens. and Exactly. And it's also a great place to get ideas. And even I'm doing a virtual garden tour, and I know Mike did a, a virtual tour of his garden. I don't know if it's posted on your Facebook. You know what? I haven't gotten to it yet. I have to do that. Um, oh, I, are we getting, uh, Peggy, it looks like we're getting the uh, the closed close captioning. Yeah, that's Facebook generate automatic. I don't Automatic, but we can yeah. turn that off, can't we? I don't think so. Are Randall you, tried turning it off a while back. Yeah, I don't think we can some, turn it off. Something, another thing to yell at Mark Zuckerberg for? Mm -hmm. Okay. God. There's that, that format. Yeah, because it, it does the music. Like, it does everything. It is so close. Oh, I guess we are still on Facebook. Somebody just said. Okay. Yes, Good. So. <laughs> so, okay. So we're talking about Scott saying we can, newbie gardeners can learn from visiting public gardens, talking with professional horticulturists, and ex accessing curated free information. Yeah. I know I, I did that a lot years ago. I would go to the Chicago Botanic Garden um, every couple of weeks and just go back to the same garden and see how were the plants growing? How did they progress? 
So a 40 and, and if you have those times in your garden when there's nothing blooming and you're like, oh, it's I need something, that's the good time to go also. What's blooming mm-hmm. at the botanic garden that would work in your space? You know, every once in a while, I still go to botanic gardens as often as I can because I'm new plants, new ideas, new combinations. You know, I think it's a great idea for newbies and also those of us that have been gardening a long time. And sh- all the botanic gardens are great. If you yeah. go to Chicago Botanic Garden, haven't been there, go with a plan. You know, I go there and it's like, where do I start? I only have one day. And so yeah. sometimes it's good to start with a plan so you don't spend 45 minutes with the people yeah. you've you know joined going, where do we go now? Welcome back. Just a rose in the garden of weeds. Uh, and that describes our guest, Melinda Meyer. I think I might be the weed, but okay. No, you're the rose. You're, you are absolutely uh, the rose. And, I'll uh, send you that check later, Mike, for all your compliments. <laughs> and I'm looking for the, the bump here because I sent it to myself, and now I can't find it. It's got to be here someplace. Oh, well. That was, yeah, that was someone's grandfather. Yeah, uh, see, things are just disappearing. Off there, I, I can. I have no idea because I had the list here and I send it to myself as well so that I That could, is Just a Rose in a Garden of Weeds by Arthur Mitchell. Yes, Arthur Mitchell. Uh, who knows whoever Arthur Mitchell is, uh, and maybe a lot of people do. I don't. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Melinda Myers. Uh, go to Melinda Myers, M-Y-E-R-S dot com, and you're going to find videos, you're going to find audio, you're going to find tips, you're going to find, um, also, you're starting to do virtual presentations, aren't you, Melinda? You bet. I'm doing webinars. I miss meeting gardeners in person. I think we all miss that interaction that we have. And so it's not as good as, as hanging out with all of you at a, a garden talk or presentation, but it's the next best thing. And so check my website. Um, I'm doing a virtual garden tour this coming week. I'm hosting a few of the garden sites. And, you know, I think garden tours are a great way to see what other people are doing, get ideas, you get in their backyard. I know you did one also, Mike. And yeah, so that... <laughs> nearly killed me but it was fun it was fun but boy was i exhausted when i finished that technology has a different element doesn't it to anything we do and so then i'm doing water wise gardening food gardening for everyone what you could still plant even if you live in the midwest maximizing your harvest pollinators we're doing a variety of topics so visit my website all the links are there they're free and, um, you know, I just want to make gardening uh, information available for people and to stay connected at some level. And I had my first one last week, thanks to Pasquazi um, Home and Gardens and a little technical difficulties, but we got it figured out. And thanks for people's patience. I think, you know, the first one's under my belt, right? It's always easier the next go round. So hoping people will join me on those. And rain gardens is another topic I'm going to be covering. Uh, you know, and that's that's part of what we're dealing with here, too, is getting over the, the tech end of things. And uh, I've had that and everybody who's done one of these Zoom things has had tech problems. Um, and uh, I think, as you say, gardeners are very understanding and they want to learn. Uh, right. And so I, I would advise folks to go to one. Of, when's your next one? When's the first one? The, the virtual tour will be fa- on Facebook Live, and that's starting next week. And then my first webinar is the following week, and that one is uh, Food Gardening for Everyone on Wednesday, whatever that is a week from this coming Wednesday. I've lost all track of days of the week. I think it's the 21st, maybe, but it's on my website. That's food. Oh, uh, good. 22nd. Thank, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have my cal- an old-fashioned calendar in front of me. Um, and so that's on food gardening for everyone. So don't think that, you know, if you've got a little space, you could still plant a few things. And if you've got things in the garden, we'll, you know, talk about how to harvest to get the most out of your garden. And then even plants for next year. I mean, I think every gardener, as you go out in your garden, I have a list of, oh, I need to do this different. I need to get that in earlier. I need mm-hmm. to do this. I want to do that. And so it's a good time to evaluate as well. So that's coming up 
on the 22nd. Yeah. And I would say based off that as well, take photos, not just, not just a journal, but take photos so you can see where things are that you want to move or where plants didn't come in. You know, because our memories fade in January when it's time to start ordering your seeds or making your plans. And, and the phones with cameras have made mm -hmm. this so easy, you know, mm -hmm. in your back pocket. And you can pull it out and take a picture so you don't like, oh, I forgot to do that. It's a month later. My problem is that I'm always taking pictures of butterflies and I never remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take pictures of my plants because I'm too busy chasing the butterflies out there. There and goes Mike mm -hmm. with his camera. <laughs> A butterfly and uh that's that and then i get mad at myself because i'll be standing there i had the, oh there was a tiger swallowtail the other day and it was so beautiful and i didn't have my camera and i ran to get the camera and of course it was gone yeah, and that's the way those things work too although i have been seeing peggy uh a lot of monarchs in my yard i have a ton of milkweed and one of the things i've discovered and i have the uh uh the common milkweed uh mm -hmm. midwest and um uh, I, I've not been able to get butterfly weed, uh, to, you know, Sclepia tuberosa to grow at all in my Mine yard. came back over the winter. I was so excited. Really? Yeah. First time ever. Melinda, you, you're going, like, that's a problem? Oh, no, no. With the, well, no, I was like, I wanted to say, I now live in, in a place that has almost like pure sand soil. So my butterfly weed is great. When I lived wow. in the city, I had heavier soil. And I, it was struggling. It's late to emerge. So mm -hmm. always mark that location so you don't weed it out. I know that's not your problem, but I yeah, found it it's, oh, it's, it's totally my problem. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, no, that was the butterfly weed. But sandy <laughs> soil, uh, common milkweed, it, it when you plant it, it's one of those that can take over. Yeah. You know, and I'm like you, I'm seeing lots of monarchs. I have lots of milkweed. I'm trying to help direct it into certain large areas. You know, it doesn't always agree with where I think it should grow. So, you know, it's, but it's great to see those. You know, my feeling about the milkweed is uh, my yard's small enough that it's not that hard to dig up. And right. uh, this year, um, I had a lot of stalks come up. The ones I didn't want, I just cut back. I just cut right. them to the ground. And, and so now I've got this stand. And what I've discovered is uh, milkweed is a pollinator magnet. Uh, it is just everything, butterflies, bees, wasps. We had a hummingbird moth in here. I mean, everything. Exactly. And they smell good, too. The flowers yeah. smell wonderful. So it's one of those I always like to warn people, you know, just beware so you're ready, so that you're ready yeah. to pull out those unwanted stalks. It is got a deep rhizome. So pulling them out, you'll they'll come back until you keep after them. But it is a good way to contain them. And then clip off the pods before they open if you don't want to share the seeds with other areas in the garden or your neighbors. No, 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 no. What you do, right. No, no. You, you, you <laughs> I call those milkweed bombs and you toss them into your neighbor's yard, okay? And that's what you do. And you go down the block and you just <laughs> toss them in the very So Mike's floor. list of people getting even is growing by the minute. <laughs> No. Hey, hey, cup plant, milkweed. They're, all, they're already after me for the cup plant, right? I got cup plant all over the neighborhood. That uh, nobody. Well, that's a t that's even I think worse than milkweed. I think so. I, yeah, you know, we won't talk about my prairie plants that have escaped. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're yeah. just helping spread the joy. <laughs> that goes right back to that conversation. Don't assume because it's native, it is friendly. It, is, I mean, they're yeah. friendly to, to pollinators, but not necessarily to landscapes or a little too friendly to the landscape yeah. we're moving okay. in <laughs> okay uh melinda myers thank you so much what a pleasure it's always great to have you on the show we'll, we'll do it again before uh too long and uh again go to melinda myers.com uh m-y-e-r-s make sure you sign up for one of her seminars coming up and uh happy gardening for the rest of the summer you guys too thank you it's always a pleasure and so much fun and and good luck to all your listeners in their garden remember next year is even going to be better have even better. All right, it's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. For those people on the network, go green or go home. Here, uh, <laughs> waiting for us on the Zoom machine, and he's actually well versed in Zoom uh, because, as he tells us, he has a lot of Canadian friends. Hey, 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 and uh, uh, I'm not sure why uh, uh, Canadians uh, love Zoom, but uh, maybe he'll explain it. His name is Paul Wheaton, and he has just put. Uh, a new book together 
with Sean Klassenkoop called Building a Better World in Your Backyard Instead of Being Angry at Bad Guys. And it's a book about permaculture. Now, one of the things you need to know about permaculture, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Paul, is that if you type it in uh, a Word document, the squiggly red line comes under it because Word has not accepted permaculture as a real word yet. Um, and I find that actually quite annoying. The other thing, they, they don't even accept arborist as a real word yet. And, and neither are new words. Uh, no, they've all been around for a, quite a long time. In fact, Paul, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, it's good to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Uh, I, I think so. I think I so. I like too. it when people have actually read my book and we talk about it. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, I can't wing it. I'm uh, especially in terms. You know, uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, if you listen to a radio program, and somebody's doing an interview with somebody who's written a book, and their very first question is, "So, tell us what your book's about." You realize they haven't <laughs> read the book. Okay, they have no idea what's in. Maybe the Maybe they read the intro and the back cover. If you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, right. If if they even did that. Uh, some, some, uh, I think some, uh, interviewers, uh, prize their ability to wing it. Uh, and if they're doing, you know, a book a day, I can understand that because I can't read a book a day. Um, fortunately I have a week, uh, usually to, to, to prepare for it. And your book, Paul, is 340 pages long with appendices <laughs> and, and thank yous. And we read the PDFs. <laughs> and the P and we read the PDF version. And we should say right now. OK, you need to know if you're listening right now, you're interested in permaculture uh, and you'll be more interested as we talk today. Uh, it, you can get a free copy. Yes, free copy of this book. And you have exactly 28 hours. We're not sure why Paul went with 28, but he went with 28. Um, starting I sent right it to you a few hours ago and, <laughs> and we and it's like, let's we're gonna do this for 24 hours. It's like, well, here it is a little a little early. So, you know, so by the so time your show starts, about 24 hours will be left. All right. So now you have 24 hours. The <laughs> clock, folks, is ticking. OK. And, and I think it's about 170 pages. It's not. I don't think it, you said 340. And I thought, what? No. What? Which first? Well, it, is in the P it is in the PDF. It is in the oh, PDF. Is it? Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it may just be um, size smaller. So, okay. yeah, wow. maybe that. See, we don't have the print copy. We just had the uh, the PDF version. So, uh, yeah, the, believe me, the first thing Peggy and I do is we scroll down and we see what the last page is. Okay, <laughs> then we know. And how long is the appendix? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, how do we get the free book? Uh, so you can go to my website, mikenovak.net, and at the the end of the blog post that I've written about Paul Wheaton and his new book, uh, in in boldface, it says, "If you want a free copy, click here." And you do that. And about the only price you have to pay for it is that people have to sign up for your newsletter. Right, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think if they if they do that, I think we've got like 40 other things that we'll give them to. And I, I don't I don't think they're weak things. Cool. I think they're pretty strong, good things. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, can you give me? Oh, yeah. I can see a whole bunch of things here. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think the most popular stuff are going to be the rocket mass heater plans. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the next thing is going to be uh, the solar station plans. Um, there's some um, amazing presentations, for example, by Willie Smits. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of feel like when we want to find out how to really save the world, we should all turn to find out what Willie Smits is doing. He's doing amazing stuff. You know, uh, we almost had him on the show. We were this close, and it, we, we were trying to work out uh, a deal. I mean, we still could. But we were he, trying to work out time zones. Uh, yeah, yeah, because he's on the other side of the planet, yeah. and he was in a film that we reviewed on, on the show. Um, and he is doing remarkable work in actually recreating rainforests in Borneo, right? Yes, yes. Um, and, in, and increasing the overall rainfall it, it, you know, through acts of basically permaculture. Um, and so his work is phenomenal, but he came out to my place a couple of years ago and geez, you know, that guy seems really smart uh, when you see him in those uh, documentaries and yeah. and when he's giving his TED talk and it's like, man, you're just scratching. He, he understands 40 languages. That, that wow. guy, that guy is a superhero in like 19 different ways. 
he actually speaks orangutan as well. I'm yes. not sure. I think he yes. does. Yeah, um, he's got lots of stories down that road. And of course, the number one thing that he advocates above all other things is to not use palm oil. Yes. Yeah. And that's why we were going to have him on the show, because he talks. I've got a, actually an audio clip on my computer right now of Willie Smith's. Uh, I would have to track it down, and I, I, I probably couldn't. But talking about the damage that has been done mm -hmm. by those plantations in, in that part of the world. Uh, and, it's, and palm oil, if you can avoid palm oil at all, and Peggy knows this because she's written about this. Uh, she's a publisher of Natural Awakening Chicago magazine, uh, health and wellness magazine. Uh, which is uh, has a is a national uh, magazine, but has franchises around the country. So I don't know if you've ever seen that, Paul, uh, but I know that uh, Peggy has handled this issue for many many years. Did you see the part where Willie Smith wrote in my book? So there's a uh, chapter where I talk about like yes. how do you do this for twenty thousand acres, and at the mm -hmm. top, because I sent a review copy to Willie, and, and he's like, "Well, I'm just getting on a plane to fly across the planet." So this will give me something to read. And then I got back all these notes. And then I said, I want to take this note that you wrote and put it at the top of that chapter. And he That's said, okay. Chapter. So um, it's like, he said, basically, this, he says, this is what I do. Yeah. And so I, I felt like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> you should feel that way. Uh, all right. Well, we will never even be able to scratch the surface of this. But you talk, you, you start the book. Uh, by talking about energy use and people who use energy and, and, and a lot of people who listen to my show, our show, uh, are interested in doing things better on this planet. But you, you take it to a whole new level. Um, and I think part of the reason you can, well, actually, one of the things you start with that is, is kind of interesting and a bit controversial is incandescent light bulbs. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, no. He's oh, like, no, no light bulbs. I don't want to be the light bulb guy. But, uh, right. uh, you don't have right. to. So just the give key us... thing is with the light yeah. bulbs is any discussion about light bulbs is trivial. It, and the reason why I have to mention it in my book is because so many people are like, no, no, I don't need to hear anything about whatever it is you're going to say because I already bought the light bulb. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. I bought yeah. the light bulbs. I've Go saved over. the planet by buying light bulbs. And it's but like, you haven't. Oh, and it's you like, know, it, yeah. actually, your choices in buying those light bulbs, you actually made things worse. And you don't even know it. It's just that it's, it, it's, it's like the premier example of greenwashing. Well, you have to explain why you're making things worse. Now, I think a lot of people know that a compact fluorescent is probably was we went down a wrong path because there's so many toxins in that one. And I mean, you can't even dispose of it unless you, you go to a hazardous waste place. All right. Uh, but folk, I know folks right now are listening and saying, well, what about LEDs? What's wrong with LEDs? Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, I have a lot of things to say, but let me, let me back away from the light bulb thing a bit while embracing the light bulb thing. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going, I'm going to dance a funny step right now. When you try, let's, if you look at your carbon footprint, the average adult American has a carbon footprint of 30 tons per year. Mm -hmm. And when they start thinking about how am I going to reduce my carbon footprint, one of the things that they think of is I'm going to buy a Tesla. Well, congratulations. <laughs> uh, if you had an average American car and you went with a Tesla, you reduce your carbon footprint by two tons per year. But if you uh, are living in Montana, say, or someplace with a cold climate, and you switch from electric heat to a rocket mass heater, say, so you've reduced <laughs> your heat, then you've reduced your carbon footprint by 27 tons. So out of 30, a, out of 30. Yes. And, and so it's like, really, heat is the big thing. And, and of course, a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to be cold. And it's like, I don't want you to be cold either. Yeah. And a lot of environmental stuff is about sacrifice. And I hope you guys that you both read the book. Do you agree that everything I put in that book is about making your life more luxuriant? Yes, uh, for the most part, I, I I wouldn't go I wouldn't go 100% on that because there there are arguments that I I would make, but I can see the argument you're making. Okay, all right. So now um, the thing is, is it's like one of the techniques to help reduce your heat is to heat the people in your house instead of heating the whole house. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I advocate is is that, for example, at your desk, you could put a dog bed heater at your feet. You could put a, there's a special kind of heat mat that can go underneath your keyboard and mouse. 
And then the star of the show is to put um, a swinging arm lamp uh, with an incandescent light bulb in it. So it hangs little ways over your head. So you're going to get heat. Because the, the, the other light thing bulb. Is, is that that light bulb puts out, the reason why they say it, it's terrible is because it puts out like 96% of its energy is put out as heat. But it's put out as radiant heat which is an extremely efficient form of heat. All right, Most we need to uh, hold, hold, hold that thought right there. We got to take a break. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking to Paul Wheaton. We'll be right back. Okay, so just so you know, Paul, we're, we're still uh, streaming audio on Facebook uh, okay. at, at the mo- and YouTube at the moment. Um, okay. And we, we, we throw this in as a bonus for our people who watch us on these uh, platforms, even though we're not on the radio right now. Well, and... and- before you get on the the light bulb heat the one thing that i looked at that was like an aha because i do get a lot of drafts under my desk was putting that like the curtain katatsu yeah i was like yeah i have to do that this winter because that's one of the big things my feet freeze sitting at my desk see now i want you to be more comfortable i want i want to make it so that you are as comfortable as is possible and at the same time dramatically reducing your energy usage, dramatically reducing your carbon footprint, dramatically reducing your CO2, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. like, I think I kind of give, and and the book is not intended to be perfect, but the book is intended to put a bunch of stuff into your head. Right. And then later, hopefully global conversation. Yeah. Cause that, that's definitely, I live in a hundred year old house. Mike's got what about a hundred twenty year old house, and even with insulation, one hundred thirty year old. One hundred thirty, yeah. Even with insulation and a lot of the other changes, you, there's there's still drafts. There's still things that just they're there, and turning the heat up to heat the rest of the house when I'm in one room, like you say, is it's a big waste. Right. Oh yeah, and um, and I think we've got it very carefully, very well documented to be able to be perfectly comfortable in the space. Like it feels like it's seventy or seventy five. But the thermostat says 50. Yeah. And it's um, dramatic yeah. savings. Nancy, can you turn Paul's audio up a little? We have a couple of people on Facebook saying he's a little low. <laughs> That's yeah. the first time. Or Paul can talk <laughs> louder. <laughs> yeah, you're on one. That's weird because I'm, I'm getting him full blast here. So yeah. I, yeah. I, it might I, just I, be the way it's hitting Facebook. Yeah, it's one yeah. channel, so I keep adjusting. But yeah, Paul, you might want to scream. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't oh do my that. God, if, if that man talks any louder, you won't need a microphone from Missoula, Montana, okay? <laughs> but but we'll, we'll 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 pick up this part of the conversation and I'm sorry to take you down the incandescent road, but it it does lead into the energy conversation and that's the whole point. You know how right. to dodge. You know how to direct the conversation like that anyway. I I think that since it's so unusual where I'm interviewed and uh, people have read my book, I want to ask the two of you the big question, which is that if my book were in 100 million brains, would our global problems become almost solved or possibly entirely solved? Or a lot, uh, lot of them, not all of them, but many of them. Let's, we can bring that up. 30. are what you eat and you are what what you eat eats and you're even what 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 you eat eats eats here's a clue why don't you take a peek beneath your feet yeah mm-hmm. welcome formidable back to the Mike Novak. what was that is that formidable vegetable that is charlie mcgee Live. Charlie McGee, a formidable vegetable, yeah. Yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> I and, love his music. Oh, uh, it's uh, the prize. <laughs> uh, how about that? Get, <laughs> all right. Hey, Paul, you get a copy of your own book. You don't want that prize? I What? What? What's going I, on? Oh, I, I, get, I win? <laughs> you win a copy of your own book. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, I found some permaculture songs. You'll probably recognize the next one when we play, when we come back from the next break. Uh, this is the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We are talking to Paul Wheaton um, about his brand new book, Building a Better World in Your Backyard, uh, and written uh, with your your co-author is, again... John Klassenkoop. Okay. And, a Canadian. Uh, 
a Canadian. <laughs> and uh, you are known as the, by the way, Jeff Lawton himself said you are the Duke of permaculture. I should have played Duke of Earl in honor of that, but I did It's not. right over your shoulder behind you, even I oh, see. Oh, uh, yeah, I got that from um, Sepp Holzer. Sepp Holzer gave that to me. Ah. Yeah, okay. I, that's what that's my one of my most prized possessions now. <laughs> yeah, so Thanks, Sepp. Uh, we um, uh, started uh, uh, down that hor horrible rabbit hole, which was incandescent light bulbs. But the, the point of that is about how much money we spend on heating ourselves, which is the chief uh, energy suck uh, uh, yeah. in the world. Um, and that's the point you were making when you went there. So continue that conversation, because one of the things you say in your book, if you don't want to be an eco-poser, um, uh, eco uh, you need to get your uh, heat and electricity bill to under $1,000 a year that's your uh scale that is that is per what you, for yeah. per or oh, per adult per adult oh yeah see, i missed that part okay because that's that is the average and and so the point i was trying to make because it's kind of like when we try to make change mm -hmm. we hit barriers powerful barriers and they're human barriers um and and uh, so then a lot of them are saying, I shut you down in the name of environmentalism. And it's kind of like, well, let's take a good look at your environmental footprint. And uh, it turns out that a lot of those people that are saying that, like, I'm an environmentalist. And so I hereby stop you in the name of the environment. It turns out that uh, they fail this simple test, which is to simply have less than what the average American footprint is for energy and heat. But I should just say energy. Because um, the average American uh, footprint is, uh, I believe, 60%. About 60% is heat. And granted, if you're in Florida, it'll be different than if you're in Montana. But yeah, here but in Montana, it's more like it's closer to 75%. But, but air conditioning is part of the heat thing. Let's, we could say that, sure. And, yeah, okay. uh, um, but the, the big thing is, is that I was talking about the light bulb thing. The, the light bulb is a very efficient form of heat. It's, it's giving you radiant heat. Most Americans heat their home with convective heat, where we heat the air and then the warm air heats us. That's right. the least mm -hmm. efficient form of heat. And so then if you're sitting in a place where uh, you're very, very warm because of the uh, heat coming from the light bulb and the heat from the mat, which is conductive heat, even more efficient than radiant heat, um, or the dog bed heater at your feet, um, and then Peggy mentioned uh, a katatsu uh, when we were on break. And it's like, yeah, those things are amazing. Uh, and we can talk about those later. So, <laughs> so for, for someone who's listening, what does that term mean really quick? Katatsu? Yes. So it's yeah. a Japanese thing where basically it's a little bit of a blanket that's attached to the edge of your table. In our case, maybe a desk. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of like a comforter. And generally there's a tiny heat source under the table. In our case, it might be the dog bed heater. And then the heat accumulates under the katatsu and uh, keeps you very, very warm. And so it's a very popular thing in Japan where they tend to keep their rooms a little cooler in the winter, mm -hmm. but everybody kind of sticks their legs under the katatsu. All yeah. right. The, the important thing about the light bulb is, is that, yes, the old school incandescent light bulb wasted 96% of its energy as efficient heat. But here in Montana, I don't know about Chicago, um, but, but here in Montana, it happens to get cold about the same time that the days get short, and you want more light in the evening and heat, light and heat. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a novelty. This thing produces light and heat in the wintertime. Bizarre. And not only that, but it's a more efficient form of heat than the way most people heat their homes. So um, this technique alone, just by itself, a simple technique, um, will uh, cut 80 to 90 percent off of your heat bill. And so when you're thinking about carbon footprint, um, this little technique featuring an incandescent light bulb uh, uh, will save you possibly thousands of dollars each year. Um, and uh, it cuts your carbon footprint far more than buying a Tesla. Now, if we go back to the conversation of like, by the way, by the way, I'll stop you there. Who's got the money to buy a Tesla anyway? Come on, dude. I, you know, I would, that, that's not something that would, uh, is in the realm of possibility for most people, including me. 
I work in radio. There's no money in radio anymore. <laughs> you mean there was money in radio at some point? Well, I, I knew some, some six-figure guys, yeah, who were in radio, and that doesn't happen anymore, really. So uh, I would love to spend an hour talking about Tesla and what they've done, and I'm, I'm pleased. I just kind of feel like I want to add a little bit of math next to the Tesla and advocate some different things. Um, the, the important thing is, is that this is going to cut 80% off of your heat bill, and uh, when people say that the LED uses less power, I think I just explained how uh, the incandescent bulb, which I think has a much higher quality of light. I think we can all agree the quality yeah, of light from does. a full incandescent is, is amazing. It has the amber light that is better for human beings. Yeah, cuts the, yeah. the blue light. And the blue light, as we know. And so that, but we didn't even think about blue light for the longest time. We're just beginning to get into that realm. I have some people who've been on the show and we've talked about the dangers of blue light and, and how it impacts our health. So I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Paul, here's that uh, quick break here. When we come back, let's finish this, but we need to get into food as well and growing things because that's a big part of permaculture. And that's what we talk about on this show a lot. That's Paul Wheaton, uh, building a better world in your backyard. It's the Mike Novak show with Peggy Malecki, and we will be right back. And I will be right back too. Okay. <laughs> bye. <coughs> she's got uh basil the dog has started barking and uh <laughs> what, what once a week while while we do our radio show basil starts barking that's uh basil that's, has learned to get treats at this particular time or something well, like that uh, all i gotta do is bark a little bit and i get yeah. extra treats well no what happens is that whatever truck shows up he's gonna bark at anyway so it's okay. it's it's not gonna make any difference uh to basil basil's uh and, and I don't know if he gets a treat or not. I have uh, no idea. <laughs> Here's a snack to keep you quiet for a yeah. bit longer. Yeah. That's, that's what I was imagining. Was a, but uh, I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I just have a cat. So my cat doesn't bark. I don't have to, to worry about that. And she's probably outside right now. We have the backyard uh, kitty proof. She's, um, I, I often liken her to uh, a superhero with amnesia. She doesn't seem to know, realize that she can climb. Um, and, uh, and that's great. I mean, that is just, the, she doesn't bother my plants. She doesn't do, she doesn't bother the birds. It's weird. She sits out there and the birds fly around over her head and they go into the bird bath and they kind of look at her and go, Oh, no problem there. We're not going to have to worry about that cat. So, uh, that's, that's the way it's been for a long time. And that makes me very, very happy. We had a feral cat show up and eventually, uh, you know, we put like little snacks out for it once in a while. And then um, uh, eventually it had kittens. And so we're, we kind of have kittens now. Ah. It's kind of ah. nice. And they're not feral, right? Or are they? No, no, the kittens are not feral. In fact, uh, the kittens had kittens. And, and mm -hmm. it's like, the, the, so we've got the second batch of kittens now. But they're not as, the, the new kittens are not feral at all. They've, they're very acclimated to people. The first batch of kittens were a little bit feral at first. But they uh, eventually warmed up with enough attention and sure. you know, treats. Yeah, you, you, it's interesting how some become domesticated and others you just never, you, nothing you can do about it. Uh, but the next generations, obviously, when they're born uh, with human beings around are going to respond differently. So I think our Zoom kind of got a little dodgy there for a second. I'm thinking about switching my internet over to something that might be at a higher quality. If you're going to do it, do it quickly. I'm going as fast as I can. Okay, three seconds. You've got a minute and a half. Okay, I'm back. Oh, Better okay. Internet. You're oh, back. Right. Does it seem better? Huh? Smoother? <laughs> nicer? Huh? Cool. <laughs> New, improved, new, improved internet. And now, Paul's back. Okay. Well, it's, you know, it's some of the things, it's interesting, some of the things in the book, like um, gray water, which for the most part in municipal areas, suburban, urban, you can't use legal, you know, you can't reroute your gray water out into your garden due to, due to some of the ordinances. So yeah. it's, and that's and that gets to the heart of the question, and and you should get it in this segment. Uh, ask it in this segment about, you know, how we feel about the book and where it can lead us. Because uh, 
those are the kinds of issues that I have with some of, of what you write about, which, uh, the, you know, living in a city like ours is very different from living near Missoula. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I completely understand. It's how do you make it work in areas, even a lot of places don't let you disconnect downspout splash to grade so that you could go into right. your garden. Stand by. Tricky. We know what we got to do, yeah. Yeah, permaculture gonna help guide the way. Permaculture, yeah. We sing in permaculture. We'll bleed the way, yes. We revolution. It's a revolution. We sing in permaculture. Bleed the way, yes. We found a solution. That's what we did. Okay, I gotta ask you, do you recognize this song, Paul? I don't recognize that one, no. That's uh, Paul Isaac featuring the Living Roots Family Band and Jay Brave. Are you familiar with that at all? I'm not. Sorry. Okay. I got uh, you. Our intern nice. recognized it, though. Kayla knows that person, so. Does she really? Yes. That's she says, you're playing my cousin in Hawaii. That's her cousin? <laughs> I had no idea. Oh, my goodness. That. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. We get a little ding for that. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We are talking to Paul Wheaton, who is the author, co-author of Building a Better World in Your Backyard with Sean. Um, uh, and I, I can't even read my own handwriting. Class and, and Coop. Class and Coop. It's an interesting last name he has. What's a class and coop? That's what I want to know. It's a car, isn't it? <laughs> there you go. And uh, thank you. And Paul is sometimes known as the Duke of Permaculture. We're talking permaculture. We can't possibly uh, talk about all of it in, in the next 12 minutes, but I want to let you know you can read the book for free. Just go to my website, MikeNovak.net. And I'll tell you what, uh, Kayla, our intern, who, whose family just sang that song, uh, is uh, if you can go to the link and post yes, that. It, I think she's tweeted that out. We've got it up on Facebook. Right. Uh, go to the link and you get a free copy of the book. You have 24 hours to do that. Anybody, anybody, anybody goes there. It's going to get themselves a free copy of the book. And all you got to do is sign up for the newsletter. And as Paul says, there's other goodies there that you can take advantage of. All right. We've been talking about energy. And, you know, that's a huge part of, of permaculture is how do you get your energy uh, use down? Uh, but you talk about also reducing the carbon footprint, your petroleum footprint, your toxic footprint, organic versus local food, uh, going moving beyond recycling, uh, vegan versus omnivore, and we're going to go into that in just a second, versus junk food. Um, living under one roof sounds kind of like a commune. I'm old enough to remember those. Uh, growing your own food, as we mentioned, gray water recycling, Peggy was talking about during the break. The conventional lawn versus a mowable meadow. Anybody on this show who listens to the show knows that my advice for lawns is when in doubt, rip it out. Okay, because you can have <laughs> something <laughs> when you you can have you can always have something better than a conventional lawn, and that's what you talk about. Make it a meadow, let anything grow in it. Biological diversity is the key. I want to get to the food issue very uh quickly. Uh, because you you make an argument you you're you don't treat vegans you're, you're not on board with the whole veganism thing are you i think i am on board i i think i have a huge amount of respect for mm -hmm. veganism i i think that uh, uh if veganism works for you and you choose to be a vegan i think that uh, i mean you're giving up uh, some delicious things to do to make a better footprint on the world i think that that is a noble wonderful amazing path and at the same time, I think veganism doesn't work for everybody. And I think that um, there are a few people who um, want to shame others based on their dietary choices. It's like, no, you need to stop doing your dietary choice and do what I tell you instead, you know, for the world. And so by whatever authority I have, I'm saying like, no, no, they get, everybody gets to choose their own dietary mm -hmm. path. And it turns out that while people say, well, you have to choose vegan because of these environmental factors, I think I do a very good job of saying, if you grow a garden, that beats veganism from a grocery store by a mile. And, yeah, and it's, and it's, like, it's not pre-processed with all the petroleum and all the everything else that goes into making processed food that you don't even know what it is. It just happens to be vegan versus, like you say, growing in your own garden and you know where it came from. I want to... 
I mean, I think that there's something in there that is really important to me, and that is that I believe that most of our illnesses, including cancers, will simply go away if we return to a more polyculture-based um, diet. And that could include, because like right now, if you go into a grocery store, I think that it's plausible that, it, that if you go into like a, an organic grocery store, um, that possibly the thing that's the best, most healthiest food for you that has some sort of polyculture element to it probably is going to be pastured beef. Um, and I, th I think that's because in many instances of pastured beef, they are eating from a polyculture and those benefits are accumulated within their fat cells. And so then that gets passed on to the media. So a quick definition, Paul, of polyculture? It's going to be uh, like, for example, it's going to be contrary to when you have a 40-acre field full of nothing but carrots. That would be a monoculture, monocrop. A polyculture is going to be where the roots of the carrot can mingle with, say, a dozen, maybe even 50 other species. And you're also going to have trees, you're going to have hills in there, it's not going to be flat, it's not going to be tilled. And as I, I, I try to tell people that unless you got hard pan, there's no reason to ever rototill your backyard. And, and if you do have hard pan, you do it once and add organic matter and you hopefully don't have to ever do that again. Um, but And these are some of the things that you talk about. I Every time you till, you lose 30% of the organic matter. But of course, if you're starting with something that's hard pan or even just sand and gravel or whatever, there's a variety of different things that have no organic matter in it now. Mm -hmm. So till it as much as you want. It won't really make any difference. And usually what you're doing is tilling in some form of organic matter. Right, right. But of exactly. course, as you're talking about, I prefer to add texture to the landscape for a variety of reasons. But I try to, and so I, you're alluding to the chapter I wrote, which is the biggest chapter in the book, uh, how to, how to, uh, grow twice as much food with one-tenth the effort. Right. And I'm, I'm going to advocate a bunch of things where, yes, one of the things is, is that if you till less, you get an aged soil with good soil structure, mm -hmm. which uh, encourages mycelium. And then the mycelium will exchange nutrients between plants because with a polyculture, I believe that the exudate from one plant is the food for another, mm -hmm. whereas the exudate for a carrot is not the food for a carrot. So the polyculture helps with these nutrient exchanges, which are not well documented at this time. And I believe that that's where plants get most of their best nutrition that makes it a far more nutritious food for us. And so some people who would put it in slightly different terms, they would talk about the soil food web, which is to say you're encouraging biology in your soil. And one of the things about the soil food web is that in the rhizosphere, which is where the, the roots of a plant are, it attracts bacteria, it attracts fungi um, and other things which contribute to the life of your soil and help uh, uh, provide those nutrients to other plants, the exudates that, you know, and they travel from one plant to the other. So that's all, some people would say the soil food web, that's, that's the, the term that I use generally in that. I do have a question though for you. You talk about compost and you love compost. <laughs> You're, I'm hitting all the hot buttons here. Uh, yeah. you, 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 I'm telling you, I read the book. Uh, <laughs> you, you talk about how it's not necessarily the best way to deal with organic matter because it returns carbon dioxide back into the air, right? That is true. So I advocate the if you're gonna if, if you have compostables because you haven't you don't have other systems in place. So I kind of feel like you're gonna do like level one, level two, level three, you're gonna be doing composting, in which case I would advocate doing the root stout technique rather than what we generally do, which is a compost pile and everything breaks down. And then when it breaks down, it's like, well, where did it go? And it, the answer is it went up into the atmosphere. Uh, the water went down into your subsoil, but then the carbon and nitrogen that used to be in that pile went up in the atmosphere. And that carbon, of course, we don't want it in the atmosphere, nor the nitrogen. We want the carbon and nitrogen to be in our soil. That's where it's going to do the most good. Now, mm -hmm. while I'm going to just, I want to take a quick thing. You both have read my book. This is so unusual. I'm so excited. I want to <laughs> ask you guys a question about my book. Okay. okay. If my book is in the brains of 100 million people, do most of our global problems dry up and go away? 
I think it's a good start. I, 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 we live in the real world. You know, I like uh, uh, AOC's uh, phrase, and I use it all the time, I live in the world. And so, for instance, let's talk about compost since we were right at that point. I read okay. that and I went, okay, what happens in the real world? In the real world, which is my world, in the big city and in suburbs, people don't even bother to compost. They don't, and they certainly don't use your technique to put that, the organic matter in the ground. They throw it away. They throw it in the garbage. When it goes to the landfill, it doesn't end up as carbon dioxide going back in the atmosphere. It ends up as methane, which is 20 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So it's worse. So if I can tell people, you should be composting, I'm doing something good. I, I'm, I'm encouraging them to do something that's better than they're doing now. So in the real world, um, you have to make that kind of compromise, it seems to me. What do you think? I advocate that, um, oh, I, I wish for people to live collectively more. And, and I think there's a lot of problems with that and they yeah. need to be solved and I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> but I kind of feel like if you had somebody in your house that was going to capture that stuff before it went into the garbage and mm -hmm. then they're gonna do something else with it, then that problem ends up being solved. The I next get thing is, I, the next thing is, is that I kind of feel like I love what Joel Salatin has to say about how every restaurant should have a flock of chickens out back. So that way their kitchen scraps go to the chickens mm -hmm. and then they get eggs and meat back. And um, healthier chickens too. And it's good, it's but true. not everybody's going to have chickens. People live in apartments. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult world. Oh, yeah. And guess what? We're out of time. And Peggy, you're off the hook unless you got you can tell us in 10 seconds how you responded. Mm -hmm. I, I I would say the simple things. Yes. The rocket mass heater. That's a, a we tougher sell to the rocket mass heater, which is the way you're supposed to heat your home. home. OK, I guess you got to come back on the show, Paul. <laughs> we'll have to do that. All right. That's Paul Wheaton. Uh, get your free book, Building a Better World in Your Backyard. It's Mike Novak show with Peggy Malecki. Rick DeMaio is next. Yeah, we didn't even get to the mass yeah. heater. Oh my gosh. That's that's the next chapter. I think Paul, one of the big things fighting is just mass culture too. Of, of you gotta have the big house and you gotta have the this and you got you know, you gotta fight that. When well, it came, you were asking something about getting regulations, getting past regulations for a lot of different things. And one of yeah. the things that I like to say is is that uh, think about pot, marijuana, and it's like, of course, everybody waited. Nobody used any pot whatsoever until the government turned around and said, you know what? I think we're going to make this legal now. I think we've Yeah, that's so cool how so, that happened. So, yeah. so nobody Amazing. used any of it. Nobody touched it. They just waited no. until the government decided it's okay. Yep. I know. Well, yeah. let, me, let me tell you something uh, about the, um, uh, the uh, living together thing. We live in a society that has turned individualism into what I have called a death cult, all right? We won't even wear a mask to protect our fellow human beings during a pandemic. And you're saying we must all live together. And I understand no. that it, it makes- Whoa. Sense. No? No, no. I, I mean, I think that was one of the things I was gonna say for that last part was to say, I'm not advocating universal acceptance of any of these ideas. But I, I do think that there's um, probably 20% or 30% of the population that would adopt several of these ideas sure. if they simply knew they existed. Yes. I don't believe that anybody should be required to do anything that I've written about in my book. Okay. It, and I don't advocate 100% acceptance at all. It, but I do think that if somebody's doing it and they're like, yeah, now I've, I'm saving $5,000 a year and their neighbor, who's you know possibly of the variety that you're concerned about, sees that they're going to be like well i want to save money too and i want to have all this candy too and so they, they start adopting it. okay well, well, excuse, excuse me just a second nancy do we have rick we have rick okay all right great sorry uh um uh I, okay i get that and that's and that's good so uh given that i would say yeah, if we can get this book in the hands of a lot of people and they adopt, you know, 20 percent of what you say, 30 percent of what you say, we're going a long way. I, I, I encourage people to do their own baby steps along the way, like get rid of that lawn if you can or, or don't obsess over it. And cert, for God's sake, don't use weed and feed in your yard. Oh, uh, you, you just sort of break it down one step at a time. 
uh, you throw a lot of things out there, and it's a little bit intimidating, I will admit. These are meant to be just ideas. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, granted, many people are practicing everything in the book right now. But at the same time, we, we can't, when people start talking about how do we solve the world pro world's problems, the things that they talk about strike me as weak, really weak. Yeah. And so now at least I've provided something that I think is possibly 200 times stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there, we can save everything. And then stop how do you get the corporations to do it? That's the next book. You stop feeding, stop giving them money. I think it's this book. Yeah. yeah. This book Good. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's have a further conversation about this in the not too distant future. Let's get you back on and cover some of the areas that uh, we missed here. We got to get. Yes. Oh, we got thirty Actually, seconds, so I got to let you go, leave. Paul. Bye. Great talking to you. Thank you so much. Have me back. Bye. All right. We'll do. Bye bye. All right. I got it. I had to bring in uh, a little bit of the COVID memories there. Yeah. Still in a pandemic, uh, some of the songs have been really great, and that was one of the best. Uh, that, uh, and that is uh, Chuck Mead, uh, who does that. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Yes, Peggy, let's do a quick hit for Siga. Go. Well, we were talking all morning about our gardens, especially with Melinda Myers. So now's the time to let everybody see your garden with the 60-second garden challenge. Um, Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards this year has gone virtual, gone online. So you can go to chicagogardeningawards.com. I think org. I got that. .org, sorry, chicagogardeningawards.org. Why did we make it org instead of com? I don't know. Uh, could be what was available. Anyways, get, get out your phone, get out your camera, go in your garden. Take a bunch of photos, make a 60 second video, shoot a 60 second video, not a 61 or 62, just 60 second video. Go to the website, upload it, and you can win fabulous prizes like okay. the adoration of fellow gardeners. Run right now. Okay. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We had a little technical difficulty there. Uh, we're back. We were just talking about the Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards. Take a 60-second video of your garden. Go to chicagogardeningawards.org. Uh, load it up there. Fabulous prizes, even though we don't know what they are yet. And uh, anybody in the country is welcome. And, to do and if you are in Cook County, we will be once again raffling off five rain barrels courtesy of the Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Great. All right. Let's get to Rick DeMaio, meteorologist extraordinaire. Rick, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you, Mike. Um, okay. I mean, I, I was watching, I was watching my favorite TV show on MeTV this morning, and unfortunately, I had to go back to doing weather. You know, my favorite show on MeTV, Mike can take is The Lone Ranger. <laughs> because uh, okay. he, because he wears uh, the the mask over his mouth, or uh, yeah, uh, I, I I was thinking about. I was like, I wonder, you know, because about a week and a half ago, President Trump said, "I I like the way I look in a mask, kind of like the Lone Ranger." And I'm wondering, I mean, I know he watches TV a lot, but he probably doesn't have Me TV. So we should get Neil Saban, who's president of Me TV, and send it to him for free of all the and all the um, episodes of the Lone Ranger wearing the mask over his face, the top half of the face, not the mouth. You know, we could have the, the, the episode where the Lone Ranger gets confused, gets confused and he's not sure how to wear the mask. And sometimes it's over his ears. And sometimes... There you go. There you go. Oh, but God. It, but at, least, at least he wore it yesterday. Yeah. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, listen, we've had some, uh, some rather interesting weather in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it got pretty dry and hot and, and not uh, excessively hot. Not like 20 years right. or 25 years ago. We're celebrating, and, and not celebrating, we're commemorating the 25th anniversary right. of, Better the, way of, saying it, yeah. of the horrible heat yep. wave in Chicago where more than 700 people died in a matter of what was about a month, right? Well, it really, it, it kind of started on the 11th and ended like on the 16th. So it was about a five or six day period of heat. 
And what was really um, remarkable about, about that, Mike and Peg, was the 4th of July that year, we had record rainfall. The month of June, we had one of the wettest Junes on record. And the entire month of July wasn't really that hot from a standpoint of historical perspective. It just got hot really fast in a short period of time. And we learned very quickly that people who live in, you know, brick buildings without air conditioning in large, densely populated urban areas mm-hmm. really don't have a safe way of protecting themselves against deadly heat. And if you look at all the meteorological factors that we deal with uh, between snow and heat, severe weather and hurricanes and lightning and flooding, heat is by far the number one killer. And we, we kind of learned the lesson the hard way. Um, I think since then, we've, we've used science to help us adapt and mitigate. Um, and the media has helped tremendously in getting the word out. And if you guys remember, back during that period of time, we were kind of behind the eight ball um, pretty much from day one. And I mean both meteorologically and from a media standpoint. And then it seemed like for the next five years, every time it got hot, it was blown out of proportion. And then there was this backlash against the media for overdoing or overhyping every weather event. And then I think we found some sort of a, you know, some sort of a middle ground, even keel, which is where we are right now. Will we have something like that again in the future? Yeah, the chances are small, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. Will we handle it differently based on our approach using science and the media in the right way? Absolutely. So I think we're in a, we're in a better position uh, where we are now compared to 25 years ago. Well, and I will say one thing before we get on to uh, more weather, which is uh, what killed those people was poverty, and we know that. And unfortunately, that's something we still have. Uh, we have, as you say, better science, and, and uh, our media covers it better, but poverty killed those people, and I hope that never happens again. So um, Yeah, I think you make a good point there. Uh, w- let's move on to what we have here. Um, are we in, are we going to go be going back to heat? Uh, it looks like it towards the end of the week. Yeah. You know what? It's been interesting, Mike and Pig, because there's a large dome of heat that is now stretching pretty much from the desert Southwest into the Southern Plains has this kind of North wood ebb and flow. And every time you get a little bit of an ebb northward, you get these boundaries that become very active with thunderstorms. And those thunderstorms tend to move from the northwest to the southeast. We saw that uh, last night with, you know, some immense amount of heavy rain and some large hail. I mean, parts of Grundy and Will County uh, had nearly an inch and a half, two inches of rain. Lots of severe weather in those areas. But now we've cooled off a little bit, so that boundary has now been pushed southward. And it does appear that that boundary, basically the northern edge of the heat dome, will become very active again. We see another round of potentially severe weather moving through the area both Tuesday and Wednesday, and then again Friday and Saturday. But, you know, studies have shown that these these northern boundaries of the heat tend to modify the overall extent of the heat. So I think the best answer is no, we're not going to see any extensive heat come back into the Chicagoland area for the next five to seven days. Beyond that, I think the chances are still rather low. If you were okay. down in Kansas City and St. Louis, much better chance down there. All right, that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Talk to you next week. Until next time, go green or go home.